Okay, hi everyone. Um, today we'll be going over chapter 10 of Arthur Data Science. And chapter 10 is layers. So our learning objectives are to learn about the layered grammar, grammar of graphics, including using aesthetics and geometries to build plots, using facets for splitting the plot into subsets, using statistics for understanding how GMs are calculated, um, making position adjustments when GMs might otherwise overlap, and how coordinate systems allow us to fundamentally change what X and Y mean. So as an introduction, um, again, like the grammar of graphics, there are seven elements, data, aesthetics, geometries, facets, statistics, coordinates, and themes. Data is the data set being plotted, where the aesthetics are the scales onto which we plot our data. And then the geometries are the visual elements used for our data. And facets are a way to plot multiples, small multiples. And the statistics are representations of our data to aid understanding. Um, the coordinates are the space on which the data will be plotted. And our themes are all of our non-data ink. Okay, so we'll be working with the MPG data frame that is bundled with the ggplot2 package, and it contains 234 observations collected by the US Environmental Protection Agency on 38 car, car models. And among the variables in MPG are um, displaced or displacement, which is an engine size in liters, and it's a numeric variable, and highway, which is a car's fuel efficient efficiency on the highway in miles per gallon or MPG. And a car with a low fuel efficiency consumes more fuel than a car without a, with a high fuel efficiency when they travel the same distance. So highway is a numerical variable. And class, which is the type of car, and class is a categorical variable. Okay, so regard to the mapping categorical variables to aesthetics, we're gonna start by visualizing the relationship between displacement and highway for various classes of cars. Um, so here we'll have two plots on the right and the left. So for the left plot, um, use ggplot, our, da our data frame is MPG, our X is displacement and our Y is highway. And actually that's for both of them. Um, but the difference is on the plot on the left, we, um, we plot class to aesthetic class to color. And then on the right, we plot the aesthetic class to shape, um, as you see here. And we get a warning for the first plot. It's pretty much fine. But the second plot, we get a warning um, that the shape palette can only deal with a maximum of six discrete variables um, because um, no more than six become difficult to discriminate. And we have five and it makes the suggestion that we should specify the shapes manually um, if we have like more than six of them. And if you see, it might be kind of small, but if you can see in the legend for the plot on the right, for class, you only see that it has six different shapes and there's no shape for SUV. And that ends up being the 62 rows that are missing from our plot. Yeah, so yeah. Okay, next. Okay, and then continuation of mapping categorical variables to aesthetics. We can also map class to size or alpha, which is also transparency um, aesthetics as well. And, but we get warnings because mapping a non ordinal discrete variable to an ordered aesthetic. Um, is generally not a good idea because it implies a ranking that does not exist. So you see here, we have our plots, the same scatter plots from before, but this time we mapped um, class to the size aesthetic. And then on the right, we mapped cl class to the alpha aesthetic, which controls the transparency. And it gives, the, it gives you the impression that there's some sort of order or ranking between the classes and that doesn't exist. So that's why we get these warnings using size for a discrete variable is not advised or using alpha for a discrete variable is not advised.
And um, so just to note, once you map an aesthetic, ggplot takes care of the rest um, by selecting a reasonable scale to use the aesthetic and constructing a legend that, that explains the mapping between levels and values. And for X and Y aesthetics, ggplot does not create a legend, but it creates an axis line with tick marks and a label. And the axis line acts as a legend, explains the mapping between the locations and the values. Yeah, so we, actually this isn't a good example because it does have a legend. Um, oops. Okay, they all have legends. Oh, maybe it's in the next one. Okay, yeah, so this one doesn't have a legend. Um, because it just gives us the axis and the tick marks for the different values. So here we can set the aesthetic properties for our geom manually. And for example, we can make all the points in our plot blue. So like the difference between um, the code here from one we've seen earlier is where they'll put like color within the aesthetic and map it to a variable. But here we're putting it inside of geom point and we're saying that the color is equal to blue. And this, this makes it so that the color doesn't convey information about a variable, but it only changes the appearance of a plot. And yeah, because it's not conveying any information about a variable, there's no need for um, a legend with regards to what the color means. Whereas in the previous plot, uh, Well, yeah, this one's probably a better example. Like for example, in this plot, our color was mapped to the um, class aesthetic. So each, the colors had a meaning versus the other one where the blue, it's just pretty. <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything. Okay. And then when manually setting aesthetic properties, we need to pick a value that makes sense for that aesthetic. So for example, the name of a color as a character string, where that one we had color is equal to blue within GM point. And you can also choose the size of a point in millimeters where the size is, um, for example, size is equal to one, or the shape of a point as a number, such as shape is equal to one, as shown below. And you can learn more about the aesthetic mapping by looking at the vignettes of aesthetic specification. And then here we have figure 11.1, 11, 11 um, and it shows us that R has 25 built-in shapes that are identified by numbers, and there it seems like there are duplicates. For example, 0, 15, and 22, and the difference comes from the interaction of color and fill aesthetics, where the hollow shapes is 0 through 14, have a border determined by color, and the solid shapes 15 through 20 have are filled with color, and the filled shapes 21 through 24 have a border of color and are filled with fill. And that that's kind of <laughs> interesting because sometimes like I'll I've made the mistake of like changing color when I meant to change fill instead. But let's see. Um I don't know, I kind of want to demo that just to look at that one. Hopefully I'm going to do the code properly because I did not practice. <laughs> Let's see, so we have colors equal to blue. Make this equal to, I should just be able to do, is equal to one. Let's see if this works. Okay, there it works. So, okay, so yeah, so for example, this one, I just learned this line of code where, oh, hey, Tiff, looks like Tiffany was joined. Um, oh, we have other people there. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I just ran this line of code. Um, ggplot, where we're using the MPG data frame, and our aesthetics are the X 
is displacement and why it's highway. And basically I took that same code we used before for um, like this graph up here. Oh, I lost it. Okay, yeah, I basically use the same code, but then I put shape is equal to one. And like you see with the color, it changed like only the, like the outline is, um, is blue because that one is the number one is like, uh, number one is like the um, empty circle or I forgot how they called it, the hollow circle. But if I changed it to like 16, it'll be different. I'm not seeing my hook. What is six? Oh, we already went over six six already. Oh, Jesus. I'm not sure what I could. Move on. Huh. Oh, anyway, you guys get the idea. <laughs> All right. Um, I might run through the whole book before working on the exercises. Um, I was telling the folks who joined earlier, I didn't really get to do much for the book ahead of time. So um, just kind of playing it by ear. So let's go next to geometric objects or geoms. And the plots below contain the same X variable and the same Y variable and both describe the same data that they're not identical because each plot uses a different geom um, or geometric object or geom to represent the data. So here you see like the first line of each of these, like the left and the right plot, we have the data frame MPG, our X aesthetic is displacement and our Y is highway. Um, but the first one we use geom point and then the second one we use geom smooth. So the only thing we changed here is the geom. And then, so, but not every aesthetic works with every geom. For example, you could set the shape of a point, but you couldn't set the shape of a line. And if you try, a G-plot will silently ignore the aesthetic mapping. But on the other hand, you could set the line type of a line. So below, we'll see that geom smooth will draw a different line with a different line, top, line type for each unique value of a variable that you map to line type. So yeah, so here on the first one, so will be on the left where you'll see that we're using geom smooth and we're mapping shape to drag or drive to shape. And you'll see it doesn't change. Um, there's no um, there's no different shape. It just looks like um should we do the same thing like that? Hold on. Yeah. It doesn't change the shape of it, but it does like group them by the um by drive. But it doesn't change the shape because like shape is not an aesthetic for the smooth. But when we set um drive to line type, it does change the um the smooth the gem smooth. Um so here you have like a like a solid line for um four or four wheel drive, I guess. You'll have a dashed, let me see, small dashes for front wheel drive and big dashes for rear wheel drive. Okay, and then next, this one. Okay, I might have to go through the book for this one. But I think what this one is showing, let me go to the book. Yeah, so I think what this one is showing I guess the difference here are like where you're putting the grouping. So like, again, up here where we have, oh, hello? Oh, I thought I heard someone say something. 
So, okay, so the first one we had where it's like, it's highway by displacement. Um, and then, yeah, it's just highway by displacement. And then in the next ones we see, we're mapping, um, mapping like line type. So the, um, so like the displacement is, or rather, we have end up with like three different lines for the various drives. And then with this one, it's showing like how you can change, um, like kind of showing the difference of how we went to each of them, where this is like our original one, the DMs move. And then this one we're grouping by drive. And then this one, also ends up kind of doing the grouping, um, but just by setting color as drive. And then... and we can also specify different data for different layers. And here we use red points as well as open circles to highlight two seater cars and the local data argument in GM smooth overrides the global data argument in ggplot for that layer. So, okay. So first we have our ggplot where our data frame is MPG. We have the X displacement for X and highway for Y. And then we have a GM point. Um, we're using GM point to make a scatter plot. And then within that GM point, we're going to manipulate the data where we're going to filter MPG by class um, to get the two seeders, and we're coloring them red. And then again, we, um, sorry, we filter the data with the class two seeder, and we're using the shape. Um, we're setting the shape to open circle and the size to three, which makes it larger than the other points, and the color to red. And actually, let me see, open circle. Oh. So actually, these are doing two different things because it's like, so this one makes, there's actually two points right here, which I'm now realizing. There's two points. There's the first point, which we just colored it red. And then there's the second point, which is an open circle. And we make it bigger than the other point. So it's like encircling the other circle point. And then, so below we'll have a histogram and density plot that reveal that the distri distribution of highway mileage is bimodal and right skewed, while the box plot doesn't really show us whether or not it's bimodal, but it does reveal two outlier points. So we have our, so we have our code here. We're freezing the MPG data frame. And then our X, we're going to be doing highway. And the first one, we have a GM histogram where our bin width is two. And then the, the next plot, we have, we're using GM density, which makes like a density curve for us. And then the last plot, we have a GM box plot. And it shows us our two outlier points. And so ggplot2 provides more than 40 GMs, but, and we're not going to cover all of them. Um, but if you need a different GM, the authors recommend looking into the extent, extension packages to see if someone else has already implemented it. And they believe the best place to get a comprehensive overview of all the GMs um, ggplot2 offers, as well as functions in the package, is the reference page. So. I'm just gonna go to the extension gallery really quick because it's actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so they have this ggplot2 extension gallery where you can find like different geoms rather than having to kind of like make your own. Uh, super cool. Like I used, I used ggplot before in like a project. So it was like really interesting. And then the other thing they suggested, oh, we have, oh yeah, I, I can put it in the chat. 
it, it's it's very cool, right? <laughs> no worries. Yeah. And then there's the ggplot2 reference page. Yeah. It kind of goes over plotting basics or geomes or yeah, this different layers like the geomes, the stats, annotations, aesthetics, scales, guides, a lot of stuff. I also put this in <laughs> the chat. Okay. 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 So next we have like facets, and um, facets are used to split a plot into subplots, um, where each displays one subset of the data based on a categorical var var yeah, variable. <laughs> um, to facet your plot with the combination of two variables, you can switch from facet wrap, which we learned about in chapter two. To facet grid, which uses a double sided formula, which is like the rows by columns. So, okay, so here we have two different plots side by side. And on the left, we use facet wrap by cylinder. Um, and again, our, using the MPG data frame, our axis displacement and our y is highway, but we're dividing the plot into the number of cylinders. Um, so there's four different cylinders, four, five, or four different I guess, levels for the factor of cylinder four, five, six, and eight. Um, but then in the plot on the right, we're going to use facet grid to affect it on two variables. Um, so it's kind of the same, the same like base of that plot. Um, but then we're adding the facet grid and it's going to be drive on the rows. So drive on the rows. Uh, yeah. You'll see the like the kind of legend here where it's four F and R. And then we'll have cylinder for the columns where you have four, five, and six. And I think later on it's I think it's one of the questions for this chapter where it asks you about why these are blank. Um like the four. Let me see. The drive, um, four wheel drive, but with five cylinders, or even like rear wheel, kind of thing. Okay. But we can go over that later, time permitting. Okay. So then there's also like statistical transformations. So, for example, like GM bar, we're going to begin with the diamond data set. And then GM bar transforms the data with the count stat, which returns a data set of cut values and counts. So based on you have the cuts, fair, good, very good, premium, and ideal. And then it counts how many are how many of like our observations are within each um factor. And then the GM bar uses the transform data to build the plot. And cut is mapped to the x axis, and count is mapped to the y axis, like as we see here. Um, okay, and then there's also position adjustments. Okay, so then the difference between these two. Um, we're again using the diamonds data set. Our X aesthetic is cut. And then for the first one, we're putting, um, we're mapping cut to color. And then on the second one, we map cut to fill. So here you see it kind of just it changed either the outline for this one, like color changed the outline of it, but fill changed the fill within the, within the oh god um the bar itself and then this one <clears throat> and then this one where we have the fill as clarity um we end up with like a stacked bar plot 
So, and we have the different clarity levels. And the stacking is performed automatically um, using the position adjustment specified by the position argument. And if you don't want a stacked bar chart, you can use one of the three other options, which are identity, dodge, or fill. Um, sure. And position identity will place each object exactly where it falls in the context of the graph. And it's not very useful for bars because it overlaps them. And to see the overlapping, we either need to make the bar slightly transparent by setting alpha to a small value or completely transparent by setting fill to equal A. So here, here what they're showing is they're kind of trying to show you like how these, like the clarity for each are overlapping when you set identity um, position equal to identity. And I think it's somewhat easier to see it in this. I, I feel like it's easier to see it in this one. Let me see if I can. All right, it might not be that easy to see it. But like basically all of them are kind of starting at the bottom and then it just maps it's mapping them on top of each other. Like, yeah. And then to, so a way for us to avoid overplotting, like especially with um, points, is to use the position equal to jitter. And then, so next we'll also talk about coordinate systems. And coordinate systems are probably the most complicated part of ggplot2. The default coordinate system is the Titation coordinate system, where the x and y positions act independently to determine the location of each point. Um, and there are two other coordinate systems that are occasionally helpful. Um, so chord push map sets the aspect ratio correctly for maps. And it's very important if you're plotting spatial data with ggplot2. And it's not something they discuss in this book, but you can read about it in the ggplot2 book. So, and then there's this chart kind of talking about those core to Cartesian. Well, I guess they have to like eight different coordinate systems to draw on plots. The, the chord Cartesian, chord fix, chord flip, chord map, chord polar, and chord trans. Okay, so here they're going to be mapping um, data about like, New Zealand. And then for this one, this one is just the regular, the default Cartesian mapping. And then this one, they use chord quick map. And I think it just, well, yeah, what they were saying, saying about the aspect ratio. So it looks like how you would see it on a globe versus this, <laughs> what you see on the left. And then this one shows you about, um, so with the bar graph, we have our bar graph where the data is the diamonds and to our x aesthetic, we're mapping cut. And then we're also mapping cut to fill. And we don't show the legend. And then this one, let's see, game aspect. I'm not sure what that is. But yeah, so we have like our base plot. And then here we do different um, coordinate systems. The first one we do is chord flip, where it puts like rather than, than being horizontal, no, vertical bars, they end up being like horizontal bars. And then also chord polar where it kind of makes it like, not I won't say bar, um, pie chart, but like, yeah, there's in circular, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but yeah, they're polar coordinates or rather. And okay, so then there's also some resources for you to check out. So there's the ggplot2 cheat sheet and the ggplot2 Plot to package website. 
um, the Jujupat 2 extension gallery, which I'll show briefly. And then there's also the R gallery, which is, that's not the right thing. Oh, okay. I feel like this looks different than the R graph gallery I've seen. Um, let's see. But yeah, the extension page that we saw already, the extension gallery rather. Yeah, that's the same one. There's also a graph section in the R cookbook. Yeah, a cookbook for R. And of course, there's R for the S, <laughs> where we have many book clubs, including, including one for the ggplot 2 book. Okay, so that's what we have in the notes, but I figured it'd be cool if we kind of went over like some of the problems in the book. They seem kind of interesting. Okay, so like one of the, the first one is like create a scatter plot for highway versus displacement where the points are pink filled triangles. Okay, so I'm gonna take that same that same code we already have from up there. Okay, so and then we want the highway by displacement. So we have highway as our y, displacement as our x, and we want filled triangles, um, filled pink triangles. So we'll put color is equal to pink. I might have to change that to fill, actually. Oops. Eight is equal to, that's 17. And hopefully this works. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, right. Hmm. Okay, so we have 17. Maybe it was supposed to be color, I guess. Okay, yeah, so we have our scatter plot of highway versus displacement where the points are pink filled in triangles. Yeah, I guess because this one is filled in, like they said, the color maps to the fill kind of. Let me see if we have a comment. There's the coloring objects, yeah. Yeah, fills for coloring objects because this one is just like, it's smaller, let me see. This one is a solid shape, so we fill it with color. Yeah, I don't know, it might be too small to see. I don't know if that made it bigger, but I thought I made it bigger. But yeah, it depends on like what shape it is. Because number 17 is one of the filled shapes or solid shapes. So the fill is controlled by the color versus if it was one of the filled shapes like 21 through 24, then it would be filled, um, filled with that color and the color would be the outline. Okay, and then Next, we're going to do number two, where access why, why this didn't result in blue points. So here we have um, ggplot and ggplot with the MPG data frame, but you'll see that they only put the aesthetics within the geom point and, and a 
assuming that's why it doesn't work. Ah, okay, it does map them, but it does not map them to blue. Concord does not result in. Yeah, I think we would have had to put, like we would have had to put the aesthetics. Um, oh. Yeah, so we have we had to make sure that we put the aesthetics within ggplot and then just the color within geom point. Alright, so we have a comment from Ken. He said it's because he thinks it's because making arguments in aesthetic is only if you want certain aesthetic to look different depending on the value of the variable. Yeah. Yeah, and that one, yeah, that one we didn't, we weren't mapping it to an aesthetic. Like we weren't mapping color to an aesthetic. We were just saying you wanted the color to be blue. Yeah, and Ken says to make it an aesthetic look a certain way permanently, you should make the argument outside of aesthetic. Yeah, like where we put geom point, the color is equal to blue here instead. Okay, so I have never heard of the stroke aesthetic. Um, let's see. Or I wonder if this will work. Or IV inside GV plot to it. Um, it is probably easiest to go here. But, um, hmm. I'm actually not really sure where I would find that within help. I'm not sure. Does anyone have any ideas for that? Like figuring out what stroke, what the stroke aesthetic does. No, I'm not sure. I'm gonna skip that one. <laughs> or actually, oh wait, so use geom point. Oh, tensor stroke controls the size of the borders. Yeah. I'm Never heard of that one. But yeah. Um, borders of an object with the borders of points with the outlines. Would that be? Oh, that was in a different chapter. Would it be like kind of similar to like this one? Like, will we use stroke to make like something like this where you have? The points like circled like this, and you can unmute if you want. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, kind of, kind of. Um, it's mostly for objects that have an out like, like for example, remember when I think earlier in the plot you had a points where there's it was hollow. There's no fill in color. It's mm -hmm. just the outline, right? Yeah. Yeah. So stroke essentially it just controls 
the size of the borders. You want the borders to be thick or small or thin. Oh. Yeah, it only works for objects where you can fill in. Okay. Because otherwise, these solid ones, like 16, for example, it wouldn't mm -hmm. work because the border is mixed in with the fill color. So it, it wouldn't make a difference. Mm, okay, I get you. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, wait, I want to try that. I've never. Huh. Okay, 17, all right, we wouldn't want 17. So I would do like maybe 20, oh, wait, let me not change it there. So maybe you do like 24 in the scope equal to, I have no idea what the default, default size is though. I guess you could like try like, like a small size and then just change it if you need to. Yeah. yeah. I don't know the default arguments. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I never knew about that. That is cool. Thanks, Ken. Okay. And then our last question for um, section two is. What happens if you map an aesthetic to something other than a variable name, like AES color where displacement is less than five? And note you'll need to specify X and Y. Okay, so let's do. And then within AES. Okay. So the color is equal to okay, let's use this one. <laughs> Cannot use it with single argument. So error cannot use with a single argument to do a claim for oh that's why it's in that sorry I keep putting it on the wrong line. Okay. Okay, so it makes it like a um logical thing. So anything where displacement is less than five, if that's true, it's gonna be that kind of teal color. And if it's false, it's gonna be that salmon color. I didn't even know you could do that. That's pretty cool. All right. And then Other questions? Oh. We only have like 10 minutes. I don't know if there was any questions anyone else thought were like super interesting if you wanted to try them out. Otherwise, I'll just keep playing around with it. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Okay. Hmm. 
there's a lot of questions to do. So I guess if folks want to work on them, work on them on their own, or yeah, if there is any other questions anyone has, otherwise I'll just wrap up for today. So, all right, well, thank you all for joining me today. Next week, we'll be going over chapter 11, um, which is exploratory data, data analysis. And I believe Ken will be leading that discussion. Um, but thank you for joining me and joining us, and I'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.